All right, guys, how's it going? So this is part three of my Polaris versus Pascal series. This one's going to be a little bit different. For starters, we finally have news on Pascal. It's been a long time in coming. However, at the 2016 GPU Technology Conference, Nvidia finally released some information. It was Nvidia's CEO that delivered the keynote. And I watched the entire show, which was very interesting in fact. However, there's not an awful lot there for gamers. We expect to see more of the gaming GPUs talked about at Computex in June. These technology conferences are really about stuff like this. Yeah, deep learning, Tesla, which is their professional, their workstation products, high performance, technical, deep learning, basically that sort of thing. In other words, everything that isn't about gaming. But before I get on to Pascal, I'm just going to have a look at some other things that I've talked about in previous videos because there is new information coming out all the time. So it's good to keep the information updated. Right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is memory. With this new generation of cards coming in, there are potentially a few changes to the memory. We know for a fact that high bandwidth memory, HBM memory, is going to be used, at least in the case of AMD, where we saw the slide saying that Vega will have HBM2 memory. Now, from NVIDIA's keynote at GTC, we know that the largest GPU, which I will talk more about later, is going to have HBM2. However, we don't actually know if this card is going to make it into the consumer space. So the question remains of whether or not NVIDIA will use HBM2 memory on their consumer GeForce graphics cards. But let's talk some about the GDDR memory instead. GDDR memory has been around for a long time and is the standard memory. You can still buy cards with GDDR3. However, if you get the chance to buy one of those, don't take it. Yeah, because it is really quite old technology now. Any card with GDDR3 memory is going to be slow. So next up, you've got GDDR5. There was a four, but I'm not going to bother talking about that as it was only seen in one or two cards. So the main standard these days is GDDR5. With GDDR5, you're looking at transfer rates of between maybe 4 and 8 gigabits per second. And when you combine that speed with the size of a memory bus on a GPU, you get to the overall maximum bandwidth. And the bandwidth is what is important here. If you look at a card like the GTX Titan X, you can see it's got a memory clock speed of 7.0 gigabits per second. That's as important, it's not bytes. And you can see there is a standard memory configuration of 12 gigabytes of memory. The memory interface is GDDR5 and it is 384 bit wide. That gives you a maximum memory bandwidth in gigabytes per second of 336.5. So how do you actually get to that memory bandwidth of 336.5 gigabytes per second? Simply put, it is just the transfer rate of the memory, so 7.0 multiplied by the width of the bus, which is 384, and then you divide that total by 8, and that leaves you with 336 not 336.5. Now in this case, Nvidia isn't just giving themselves an extra 0.5 of memory, as the actual memory clock is 7.01 gigabits per second. You might be wondering why you divide by eight, and the reason of course is there are eight bits in a byte. If you got confused about that, you probably skipped computer architecture class at school. So let's have a look at the GTX 980 memory specs. You can see here that it has the exact same memory clock speed. In other words, it's using the same memory. However, instead of 12 gigabytes, it's only using four. And this time the memory interface width or the memory bus is only 256 bits which means the memory bandwidth in gigabytes per second is 224. So the Titan X has 50% more bandwidth because it's got a 50% larger memory bus. You can see here by looking at the diagrams, the GTX 980 has four memory controllers, whereas the GTX Titan X has six. Each memory controller is 64 bits wide. So six multiplied by 64 is 384 and four multiplied by 64 is 256. That is one way to get more bandwidth into a graphics card. You could also use faster memory. For example, if this was eight gigabits per second memory, it would have 256 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. That one's really easy because you simply multiply by eight and then divide by eight. The thing about faster memory is it costs a little bit more, especially when you reach the very top end stuff and eight gigabits per second is the top for normal GDDR5 memory. So that's why seven is the highest that we see so far. So why am I talking about this? Well, there's been a lot of rumors about a new memory spec known as GDDR5X. That part isn't a rumor, this exists. 
but the rumor started later last year, early this year, that this new GDDR5X memory be getting used in graphics cards, specifically those that are coming at the middle of the year. In other words, a lot of the tech press believe that GDDR5 is on the way out to be replaced by GDDR5X. The reason being that GDDR5X is capable of between 10 and 14 gigabits per second and therefore comes with higher memory bandwidth for the same bus width. For example, GDDR5X with a memory clock speed of 12 gigabits per second with this same 256-bit memory interface would be capable of memory bandwidth of 384 gigabytes per second. So even though it's only a 256-bit memory bus, the bandwidth can now be even more than what you see on a Titan X, which has got the 384-bit bus. Why would the companies do this? The reason for doing this is that memory controllers take up a lot of space on a GPU. So if you can cut out those memory controllers, you can save an awful lot of die space, which means they cost less to manufacture, which in an ideal world would mean cheaper graphics cards, but in the real world means that they get more profits. So this seems like the smart thing to do out with GDDR5 and in with GDDR5X. There is one slight issue with it though. It's not ready yet. Now this is pretty typical of the press. I don't know if they just don't understand some of the wording or are they just looking for hits or something else. So way ahead of schedule, the target was late summer, Micron has started shipping GDDR5X memory to its customers. So looking at this, it was the 24th of March when this story broke. However, the story really came from Benchlife, which is a Chinese website. As usual, the translation isn't fantastic. However, you can work out what they're saying here. Basically speaking, Micron, who is making the GDDR5X, have sent the first batch of samples. Now that's a big difference between shipping. Sampling and shipping are different things. Sampling is what happens with the original product before it goes into mass production. You only start shipping after you have completed the mass production. But in actual fact, you don't even need to go to Benchlife or Guru3D because on February the 9th of this year, you can see that Micron themselves are saying, they are currently ramping GDDR5X to mass production. In other words, mass production has not yet started. And they will be announcing sample dates later this spring. But most importantly, we plan to be in full volume production this summer. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, summer means June, July, August. And after mass production begins, you're talking another three, four, five, six months before it is even seen in products. In other words, the chances of seeing GDDR5X memory in a graphics card released during the summer, which is when we believe that both AMD and Nvidia should be releasing the very first Polaris and Pascal graphics cards, there's just not enough of this GDDR5X to go around. So I really do feel that the chances of seeing GDDR5X this year are practically nil. We shall see. Now, I've been talking for quite a while now already and barely mentioned Pascal. So let's take a look at what happened at the GTC. So like I said, GTC is about technology. It's not really about gaming. It's about the technology of the GPUs. Now, automotive is very important to NVIDIA these days, and they talked a lot about cars and the Drive PX2. Basically, self-driving cars, which is a high-growth area for NVIDIA currently, and one that is very important for the company going forward. Now, in this slide from Anantech, we can see they talked about VR, AI, and again, self-driving cars. They had VR on show, but it was only running on Titan X, not Pascal. The demo itself looked pretty impressive, however you could see it was clearly lagging and stuttering in parts. They also brought Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, onto the show, and it was clearly his first time in VR, and he was clearly uncomfortable wearing the VR headset where he complained about being dizzy, so not the smartest thing to do there, and certainly not the best way of showcasing VR. He moved on to talk about Nvidia's 500 billion opportunity over 10 years, it's a lot of money. And basically speaking, it all comes down to artificial intelligence and deep learning applications. NVIDIA is really branching out and trying to get away from their dependency on gaming. And all this scientific stuff is very high margin. There's a lot of money to be made in it. And simply put, NVIDIA sees the opportunity to lead here and make an awful lot of money. Way more than they will ever make with gaming GPUs. Near the end, we finally moved on to Pascal. The P100. And I think most people were taken by surprise because they have created a gigantic GPU. 610 millimeter square on 16 nanometer finfets. This is the largest GPU that either Nvidia or AMD has ever built. Even larger than Titan X, even larger than Fury X. Not by much, but already so early on in the 16 nanometer process, Nvidia has decided to push the limits of it. On a 300mm wafer, at 610 square millimeters, P100 will have a maximum of 89 dies per wafer. But right now, it will be nowhere near that number. 
As I mentioned earlier, so early on a process, there are many challenges to overcome. There will be defects all over this wafer, with each one rendering the GPU unusable. It's very difficult to know the exact numbers, but there may even be wafers where NVIDIA doesn't get any GPUs. Now, there are ways to mitigate this, however, and we can see how to do that by looking at the specs of P100. So here we are over at NVIDIA.com. We can see the NVIDIA Tesla P100, the most advanced data center GPU ever built. And over at NVIDIA's dev blog portal, we talk a little bit more about the specs and also provide a block diagram, which we can have a look at. And here it is, an absolute monster of a GPU. Down each side are the high bandwidth memory controllers, and NVIDIA's new NV link at the bottom, with the bulk of the GPU comprising of these 60 SMs, or streaming multiprocessors, broken down to 10 in each of the six clusters. But here's the thing. This is the full GPU die. However, NVIDIA is not releasing the full die to start with. Four of these streaming multiprocessors are going to be disabled. And you can see here by looking at the specs, it says GP100, Pascal, and for the streaming multiprocessors, there are only 56 out of the 60. We can also see down the bottom that they have maxed out the TDP at 300 watts. Now, previous Teslas only had 250 watt TDP or less. However, we can see here that the base clock and the GPU boost clock are very high at 1328 and 1480 megahertz, respectively. That is quite a jump that they are getting out of this. However, part of that is coming from the increased TDP. That one's pretty simple, yeah? For example, at only 250 watts TDP, Tesla M40 has more headroom to increase the clock speeds. The higher the clock speeds, the higher the TDP. This is one reason why Pascal has higher clock speeds. The other reason is, of course, the more advanced 16 nanometer FinFET process node. But going back to the SMs, cut down to 56 out of the 60, and the main reason for doing that is that problems on the wafer, problems with the GPU, the defects, other issues with the transistors, are more likely to hit the streaming multi-processor area of the GPU. So by disabling a few units on each GPU, you can help to increase the overall yield. And this is a really important thing to do on such a large GPU. Later on, as the process improves, Nvidia might be able to release a full P100 GPU. It's very much like Titan X and the 980 Ti. The Titan X is the full GPU, the full 600mm GPU, whereas the 980 Ti is a cut down version with disabled streaming multiprocessors. The thing about Titan X though is that it came very late on the 28 nanometer process. The process was already mature, defects were much less, and it was much easier to get a fully working part out of it. Right now on 16 nanometers, it is probably not even possible to get a single working full GPU off of a wafer. Now these P100s are in mass production right now, but you probably won't be that surprised to learn that they are extremely expensive. Nvidia is taking orders. If you want one, you're going to have to buy eight at a cost of $129,000. The German website Computerbase found a Pascal board with 8 P100s on it. All of these are almost certainly dead or dummy GPUs. If you look at this image, you can clearly see the 4 HBM stacks. That's the 4 smaller rectangles around the larger GPU. However, on the same board, you can see that this is missing. We're not quite sure if this is a different version of HBM, for example HBM1, or if there is just nothing there at all. The point being, this is clearly not a really full functioning Pascal board, but that's just pretty much what you would expect at this stage. Nvidia says these will be available in quarter one of 2017. So that really does give you an idea of the kind of margins and the kind of yields that these GPUs have. Between 10 and $15,000 per GPU, and you can probably figure out that we are not going to see these in gaming desktops anytime soon. There is in fact a real question as to whether or not we will see them at all, because looking at the specs, it doesn't seem all that well balanced for a gaming GPU. The thinking here is that Nvidia has created this P100 purely for this high performance supercomputing market, and the general consensus is there will be no Titan based on this GPU, and instead we will get a new gaming focused GPU called GP102. Right, now time to wrap this one up. I've barely talked about Polaris at all in this video. There's been one or two rumours since the last time, but nothing very concrete. At the entry level, Polaris 11, the smallest GPU, looks like it's going to have six different versions. In other words, there will probably be two desktop graphics cards, which means there will likely be four mobile versions. I'm pretty certain that Apple will be interested in these, and this actually could lead to a delay on the desktop. It's a very small, very efficient GPU as you've seen before. 
around about 120 millimeters squared. Nvidia's competition looks like it is much bigger. We're calling this GP107 and we believe it is around 170 to 200 millimeters square. Judging by the difference in size, I would be very surprised if GP107 is not the faster of the GPUs. However, it really looks like AMD is targeting the performance pair watt leadership down here. They've lost a lot of market share in Notebook and Polaris 11 looks like a really strong attempt at taking that back. At the mid-range, we have of course got Polaris 10 and GP104. Now, I talked a bit about these two in the last video and there was a suggestion that Polaris 10 may have HBM. However, according to a Linux driver leak, that does not appear to be the case. We now believe that Polaris 10 will also have a GDDR5 interface. I also made the suggestion that GP104 may have a 384-bit bus, but that also appears not to be the case, as another leak appears to suggest that GP104 will have 8 gigabytes of GDDR5. Had it been a 384-bit bus, it would have been limited to 6 or 12 gigabytes of VRAM. So with all the talk about bandwidth at the beginning of the video, it was really to show that these GPUs could be limited simply because they do not have enough bandwidth. They've only got the 256-bit buses and we expect them to be at least as powerful as a GTX 980 Ti. So what we're looking at here is new improved compression algorithms and possibly other features as well. For example, if you remember back to the Polaris reveal, back in January, AMD talked about something called a primitive discard accelerator. Stuff like this may be able to help with memory bandwidth as well. And I would expect Nvidia to have something similar. So people were expecting GDDR5X. I really don't think so, at least not until the end of the year. And like I said, if we are going to see a GP102 towards the end of the year, perhaps to compete against AMD's Vega, this could be the one and only card with GDDR5X this year. But that one is just pure speculation now. GP102 may not even exist. My thinking here is simple. By the time GP100 is ready for the desktop, it will probably be the middle of 2017. By that time, it's going to be up against a very strong AMD Vega card and I just don't believe it's going to be good enough. So it really does make sense for Nvidia to make a pure gaming GPU as well. It could have HBM, or it could have GDDR5X, or it could have the 384-bit bus. We simply don't know anything about it yet. Right, I'm bringing this one to an end now. So what I'll do now is declare Cyrus Bluebird the winner of the Ashes of the Singularity contest. So congratulations to you, and hopefully you'll get some use out of it. But that's it for this one. As usual, there's a bunch of links in the description below. Any questions or comments, fire away in the comments below, and I will catch you later, guys.